In this video, we'll be discussing problem number six from the 2023 AP Stats free response set. In an AP Stats free response set, problem number six is referred to as the investigative task. Typically, is a bit lengthier than the rest of the free response questions, and you should be allotting about 25 minutes for the final question in your AP Stats FRQ set. So from 2023, number, 20, number six, says that we've got a jewelry company that's using a machine that applies gold to a certain type of necklace. The amount of gold applied to the necklace is normally distributed. When the machine's working properly, the amount of gold applied to the necklace has a mean of 300 milligrams and a standard deviation of five milligrams. They're gonna select a necklace at random that's produced by the machine. Assuming the machine is working properly, calculate the probability that the amount of gold applied to the necklace is between 296 milligrams and 304 milligrams. So I just defined a random variable here. I said capital X is going to be the milligrams of gold applied to the necklace. Uh, they tell us that X is normally distributed with a mean of 300, a standard deviation of 5. I want to know what the probability is that X is between 296 and 304. Now what you would want to do is you would want to show the computation of a z-score. So if I'm going from 296 milligrams to a z-score, I would take that value of x, subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. You see I've done something similar here for the 304 milligrams. I went to a normal CDF computation on my calculator and got a probability of 0.576. Jewelry company, company wants to make sure that the machine is working correctly. So Cleo is a statistician that works for the company. She's going to take a random sample of necklaces that were produced that day. Each selected necklace will be melted down and the amount of gold applied to that necklace will be determined. Because the necklace destroyed to determine the amount of gold, because the necklaces are destroyed to determine the amount of gold that was applied, we're not going to have a very big sample size. We're going with only two necklaces when they try to do this check. So she starts by considering the mean amount of gold being applied in the necklaces. So she takes her random sample of two necklaces, she computes the mean, the sample mean amount of gold applied to the two necklaces. Suppose the machine's working properly with population mean amount of gold being applied of 300 milligrams and a population standard deviation of five. So same stipulations as we had back in part A. Now, the first part of Part B says to calculate the probability that the sample mean amount of gold applied to the random sample of two necklaces is greater than 303. Probability that the sample mean. So I read that phrase right there, and that kind of triggers, oh, I'm, I'm going to have to do something with the sampling distribution for my sample mean. So I defined X bar, my sample mean, to be the mean milligrams of gold in each sample. Uh, I am going to have to compute a standard deviation for that sampling distribution. And my standard deviation for that sampling distribution is going to be the standard deviation for the population divided by the square root of the sample size. There's a formula for that right on the AP Stats formula sheet. I guess I'm using population values, so technically I'm using this version of it. Technically not standard error this time around. And with sampling distributions for means, we're dealing with uh, T distribution. So I also need to recognize what my degrees of freedom measure would be. And for sample means, that's always going to be one smaller than the sample size. Well, in that case, in this case, that ends up giving us a degree of freedom value of one. So what's the probability that our sample mean is greater than 303? Uh, what's the probability that our T value, our T score, so same sort of structure you see here as I used back in part A. So I'm taking the, the value I'm trying to measure the probability for uh, 303, subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation for the sampling distribution. That gives me a probability of 0.276. So suppose she took a random sample of two necklaces that resulted in a sample mean of 303. Would that result indicate the population mean amount of gold being applied by the machine is different from 300 milligrams? Justify your answer without performing an inference procedure. So the probability of getting 303 milligrams or more to be the sample mean is 0.276, fairly high. Based on the phrasing, 
different from 300, not greater than, different. This is referencing a two-sided hypothesis test or a two-sided significance test. So the probability of Clio's sample being 303 or more is 0.276. If I double that to make it a two-sided situation, I clearly get a value that's much larger than any of the frequently used significance levels that we would set within one of these tests. Uh, therefore, we don't have evidence to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. So in this case, we don't have evidence suggesting the machine is applying an amount of gold different than 300 milligrams to the necklaces. What typically happens in number six is you do a few things that are fairly comfortable at the front end of the problem. Hopefully you realize what we just did in parts A and B was uh, you know, pretty typical of a lot of problems you've probably practiced with and encountered in AP stats. And then somewhere in the middle of the problem, things start to kind of be presented in a little bit different format than we're used to. The concepts and the skills that are necessary to succeed with the remainder of the problem are still going to be based on what you've learned in AP stats. But don't get too caught off guard when, when things start to be described in a way that you maybe aren't that familiar with in the midst of problem six. And so that's what's happening here. So Cleo is going to consider the variation in the amount of gold being applied to the necklaces. The sample size is small, so what she's going to use is the sample range of the data for two randomly selected necklaces rather than the standard deviation, right? With such a small sample size, uh, we're going to go with a different measure of spread than standard deviation. We are going with sample range. So she's going to investigate the behavior of the range for sample size n equals 2, and she's going to simulate the sampling distribution of the range of the amount of gold applied to two randomly sampled necklaces. She generates 100,000 random samples of size n equals 2 uh, that are independent values from the normal distribution with a mean of 300 and a standard deviation of 5. The range is calculated for the two observations in each sample. The simulated sampling distribution is shown in graph 1 look ahead to graph one. So that's what we see shown right here. Now what she went ahead and did, in addition to that, she adjusted the standard deviation to eight, and then again adjusted it to 12, and we see those sampling distributions for the sample ranges shown in graph two and graph three. So these have the same general sort of shape. Uh, we see the peak on the left, and they're definitely all skewed to the right. Obviously, the peak is higher with the smaller standard deviation than it is with the larger standard deviations, and the skew is, is definitely being dragged out further for the higher standard deviation sampling distributions. Now, if we look at what Part C is actually asking of us, they ask us to describe the sampling distribution of the sample range for sample size 2 from a normal distribution with standard deviation of 5. So they're basically just asking us to describe the sampling distribution shown in graph one. And that's definitely something that you would have done throughout your AP stats course. When you describe a distribution, you need to hit on shape, outliers, center, and spread. So we already kind of set a couple of these things. Uh, there was one peak, right? So the, the peak was on the, the left edge. So it's unimodal, and it was definitely skewed to the right. Now, what I went ahead and did is I found the median for my measure of center. So I, I noticed what was on the y-axis here were my relative frequencies. So I was trying to just kind of approximate adding some of the values of these first few bars together until I got to, to 0.5 total, right? The, the value at the 50th percentile is going to be our median. And when I did that for my first graph here, I ended up figuring out that a me the median was approximately 4 mi milligrams. And then I went with interquartile range for my measure of spread, and I did something similar. So I was adding these, the values of the totals of these bars together until I got to 0.25, right? The, the lower quartile is the 25th percentile. And then if I continue to progress out further, I was adding until I got to 0.75 for my upper quartile. And then the upper quartile minus the lower quartile is going to give me my interquartile range. And if you do that here, you get approximately six milligrams. And notice the, the use of this, right? I'm, I'm definitely uh, estimating here due to the nature of how this is presented. I did go ahead and do something that you don't necessarily have to do when you describe a distribution. 
Uh, but I already had identified the interquartile range, so I already identified that as well as the upper and lower quartiles. So I went ahead and just figured out what my upper and lower boundaries for outliers would be. So I took 1.5 times that interquartile range, added it onto the upper quartile, which I determined was 8, and that gave me an upper boundary of 17 for outliers. And if we look at that first graph, we do have a handful of, of bars here that do exceed uh, 17 on the x-axis so anything above 17 would be an outlier based on the work that I've done with that outlier test now in part B or excuse me in part 2 of part C they ask us to describe how the sampling distributions change when the population standard deviation Sigma increases I think we already denoted that as well as sigma increases, this graph has a lower peak and the skew is dra dragged out further to the right. The highest standard deviation has the lowest peak and the skew is, is even more pronounced than either of the prior two graphs. So we have more variation with higher standard deviation for our sampling distribution for sample ranges. And that should make sense. Standard deviation is a measure of variation. So let me rephrase that standard deviation is a measure of spread so when we have a higher standard deviation the more spread out our sampling distribution should be so i've basically set all those things uh, here i did try to hit on shape outlier center and spread uh, and it seems like those final two graphs although the upper boundary for outliers would increase seems like these are likely to have a few outliers on the upper end as well and then the last part of this She's again trying to check to see if the machine's working properly. So she takes two necklaces, calculates the sample mean of gold as 303, and her sample range is actually 10. Machine's working properly if we have 300 milligrams of gold being applied and a standard deviation of five milligrams. We wanna consider Clio's range of 10 from the sample size of two. If the machine is working properly, is a sample range of 10 unusual? Justify your answer. So I went back to that first graph and I tried to work across here and I, I saw that, well, 10 would be associated with this bar right here. And that is really close to 0.04. So what I said in part A is, I, or part one of part D, is I said that the probability of getting exactly that range is 0.04. And that is not extremely likely to occur, right? Probability is fairly close to zero. So that's not an extremely likely outcome for her sample range. Now, moving into part two of part D, do Clio's sample mean of 303 and sample range of 10 indicate the machine is not working properly? Explain your answer. Now, I haven't seen the scoring guidelines for this yet. So I'm, I'm going with what I assume the scoring guidelines are gonna say, uh, but after they come out, what I'm gonna explain here in this final part might need to be tweaked a little bit. So definitely try to reference the scoring guidelines if you're checking this out and they are currently available. I went back and referenced what I said earlier. Sample mean of 303 is not unusual. We identified that in an earlier part of the problem. And then although a sample range of exactly 10 milligrams is not a very likely outcome, that's exactly what we said back here. If we go back to that graph for the first sampling distribution, if I was to total the value, the relative frequency at 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, on out for anything above 10, I get a total of approximately 0.17. So a sample range of exactly 10 is not very likely, but 17% of all sample ranges within her simulated sampling distribution do exceed do equal or exceed 10 milligrams and once again since 0.17 is greater than our commonly used significance levels of 0 0.01 0 0.05 and 0 0.1 we don't have evidence suggesting that the machine is not working properly so again i have not seen the scoring guidelines they won't be released for several more months definitely reference them for this last part in particular. There, there could be something about independence and multiplying probabilities necessary to do here. Uh, but this is my best guess as to what those scoring guidelines are gonna have.